Hello Skeletons, it's Disney Queen Skelly here, and welcome back to another Versus! Alright guys, so, this one's going to be actually a two-parter, because when I look at articles for my Versus, I usually just take what's written on the screen and write it down. Well, I found out that one of the articles I found actually has two parts, and I want to be respectful to the author who wrote it and actually read both parts. So, part one is is going to be Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln versus the Hall of Presidents, and then part two is just going to be focusing on the Hall of Presidents. A Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln is at the Disneyland Resort, while the Hall of Presidents is over in Florida. Um, I'll be reading the articles. Um, if you guys still want to get give your opinion at the end of this video in the comments, you're more than welcome to, but I recommend waiting until part two. That way you guys have a full idea on what Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln is as well as the Hall of Presidents. So, in the meantime, enjoy Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. I want to apologize in advance. My dad is vacuuming, so if you hear some extra noises in the background, it's the vacuum. Honest, it's Abe. Encounter the great emancipator as he returns to tell the tale of generations past and share his stirring vision of the future. The show starts with a moving film about President Lincoln's life from the humble log cabin of his birth all the way to the White House. Then watch and wonder as he takes center stage to deliver highlights from his greatest speech, a historic presentation. Walt Disney was fascinated with the life of Abraham Lincoln. The first audio animatronics version of Lincoln debuted in 1964 at the New York World's Fair, and it was so lifelike that National Geographic magazine called the figure alarming in its realism. In 1965, the show moved to its current home at Disneyland Park, an updated President Lincoln. Next generation audio animatronics technology gives the figure of Lincoln more emotion and vitality than ever before. Every detail is presented as realistically as possible and Lincoln's own life mask was used to create the face. While no recording of Lincoln's voice exists, actor Royal Dano provides a satisfying interpretation of Lincoln's immortal words. The Disneyland Story Pursue a treasure trove of rare memorabilia tracing the creation of the happiest place on earth including a scale model of Disneyland Park as it looked on opening day, July 17, 1955. A carousel horse from the Griffith Park merry-go-round, rare illustrations, artifacts, or artworks, and models of attractions. Behind-the-scenes photos of Walt Disney, the short film Disneyland, the first 50 magical years, a nostalgic look at the park. Next, we'll be looking at the Hall of Presidents, Part 1. Early in his presidency, President Bill Clinton, in a speech that would be Heard by millions of Americans explain the very principles at the heart of America's value system and its quest for democracy. My fellow citizens, we are the heirs of the great American Revolution, and we are ready to carry our great national experiment forward into the next millennium. Suddenly, a voice is heard. And cut. That's wrap, everybody. A burst of applause engulfs the White House Library, overflowing with excitement from Disney Imagineers. The president throws an arm around Imagineer Justin Seagal's shoulder, cheering, That was fun. President Clinton was added to the Hall of Presidents star and stripe studded lineup in 1993. Justin recants the story of when he was a part of a team of five Imagineers visiting the White House in September 1993. The project? A significant upgrade to Walt Disney World's Hall of Presidents attraction, one which for the first time in the show's history would give the current president a speaking role. As the nation's 42nd president stood before a microphone and video cameras set up to film his gestures and facial nuances for audio animatronics programming, he remarked to his assistant, Have you seen the Hall of Presidents? This is a great show. President Clinton continued into the microphone, I feel like I should sing a Disney song. Hi-ho, hi-ho. The Hall of Presidents premiered at Walt Disney World on October 1st, 1971 as one of the resort's most dramatic and prestigious presentations. While it was an attraction original to Magic Kingdom Park, the show was actually conceived 15 years earlier as a Disneyland attraction, park attraction. What many don't realize is just how close the Hall of Presidents is to the original ideas conceived by Walt and his team of Imagineers those many years ago. Let's delve into the Walt Disney archives and learn more about the evolution of this Walt Disney masterpiece. Why don't we begin our journey on Liberty Street? No, not Walt Disney World's Liberty Square, but a never-built addition to Disneyland that would have been an extensive recreation of a typical American street in the Revolutionary area. Let's take ourselves back to 1957 and see what such a land might have been. So if your imagination is ready to enter the Disneyland that never was, here you go! 
Tinkerbell welcomes us to Liberty Street in a 1956 press package. Walking right down the middle of Main Street, USA, it's 1957 Main Street, USA. Town Square is a buzz with excitement as we work our way toward the northeast corner. Just ahead of us along the new cobblestone street is a world of old. The story is of America's heritage and its relation to the concept of freedom of enterprise. Notions that are reflected in the architecture and details surrounding us. The revolutionary buildings to our left house a variety of shops. Apothecary, glassmaker, print shop, insurance, cabinet maker, dot dot dot. We soon arrive to the cornerstone of this new land, Liberty Square, whose central icon is an impressive Liberty Tree. Just beyond it, we find Liberty Hall, where we enter a large foyer surrounded by dioramas depicting famous scenes from the Revolutionary War. Here, too, is the gateway to the heart of our new land. Auditoriums which feature the two tableau productions, the Hall of the Declaration of Independence and the Hall of Presidents of the United States. In the first curtains, part the unveil a life-size figure of Thomas Jefferson discussing drafts of his fundamental document with Ben Franklin and John Adams. Behind the next curtain is the actual signing of the Declaration of Independence, followed by the ringing of the Liberty Bell. Golly gee, that was loud, you think to yourself, removing your tri-cornered mask of your hat. Our next experience is the Hall of Presidents, a mighty cavalcade of American history, as seen through the eyes of our nation's leaders. Here, lighting, staging, and music and narration combine to create a living experience for us. The show begins with figures of Washington and the president immediately succeeding him, standing in silhouette. A compelling narrative recants trying times and explores the formation of our heritage as excerpts from famous addresses of our nation's leaders echo through the theater. The music swells as the finale reveals a spectacular view of all 34 presidents on stage and a rear curtain opens to reveal a cinematic scope style motion picture screen featuring the nation's capital. Wow, this could never happen anywhere else, you think, as the genius of Walt Disney trumps our imaginations yet again. We're compelled to move on to that other new addition, Edison Square, is it? But we'd better get back to reality. Plusing the presidents. As we know, Liberty Street wouldn't open in 1957, but work would continue on the Hall of Presidents for years to come. Walt himself assigned James Algar, director of the True Life Adventure series, to perform extensive research on the United States presidents and our nation's founding documents in preparation for the True to History show. In a February 1955 meeting, Walt and Key WED Enterprises personnel determined that the Constitution would serve as the basic story background for the president's show and that the attraction could also depict growth and progress, the presidents, and future. Ideas that eventually became hallmarks of Walt Disney World's Hall of Presidents. By this time, the show had possessed a stronger direction. Its first portion would employ Circurama technology to create a five-screen wrap-up around 180-degree film presentation, featuring enlarged paintings that would depict moments for, from our nation's founding. The climax would send audiences right into the middle of a violent civil war battle. W.E.D. artist Sam McKim explained this multi-sensory moment. Walt wanted artillery that would fire from one screen across to the other, across to the enemy on a screen at the other side. And you'd see things blow up, and then you could smell cordite. It was smell vision But by far the biggest challenge facing W.D.D. Enterprises was the sheer price of the technology needed to bring 34 human figures to life. Originally, the presidents would have been little more than wax figures, but Walt's vision of having them realistically stand and speak was not yet feasible. Looking to sponsors to overcome this hurdle, WED compiled a presentation, which included a small model theater and a 32-minute slide presentation, which would dazzle potential corporate backers, a fair saves the day. Meanwhile, Walt's preparation for the 1964-65 New York World's Fair would provide a valuable opportunity for major organizations to fund the research and design of new technologies for Disney's attractions with the hopes of incorporating the President's show into the fair's menu of offerings. WED rechristened the attraction One Nation Under God and brought their mock-up to New York's RCA Victor Theater in June 1961. While the World's Fair staff responded with excitement to the presentation, corporate leaders from such companies 
as Coca-Cola, Hallmark, and Union Carbide, found the cost to be prohibitive. One organization would admit that the show evoked many powerful emotions, but they were ones unrelated to the quality and identification of its products. Something was missing from the presentation. What would better sell one nation than a president himself? Walt realized that he had to do one of these to sell the package, Mick Kim explained. The goal now was to create a full-size, lifelike audio animatronics figure, something that would speak on its own and demonstrate the realism that Disney, that the Disney team envisioned. Walt had already turned to an animator-turned-sculptor, Blaine Gibson, asking him to start creating busts of presidents George Washington and Teddy Roosevelt, but the boss wanted our 16th president to be built first. After all, Walt had always had a great admiration for Abraham Lincoln, a tribute to all presidents, but mostly Lincoln. Of help to Blaine was a copy of a life cast of President Lincoln's head, made in 1860 by Chicago sculptor Leonardo Volk. Although Blaine used it in reference for a bust to be made of the president, he exaggerated a few facial characteristics based on his understanding of characters. W.E.G. had created a figure that could rise from the chair by the summer of 1961, but the project still had extensive challenges. Walt called upon engineers Roger Braggy and Bob Gurr, demanding, I want half the weight and twice the motions. Bob perceived the figure as though it were an airplane made of lightweight equipment and designed the mechan mechanical parts for a realistic Lincoln in only 90 days. Quite a feat for such a tall, slender personage. Why didn't Walt want Grover Cleveland? Bob once asked. Nothing he had, he'd have more room for the mechanical design. But it was the major do major domo of the World's Fair himself, Robert Moses, who would champion one nation under God. In April 1962, Moses, while visiting the Disney studio, t took to look at progress on Disney's other World's Fair projects, encountered the Mr. Lincoln figure who extended his arm to shake hands with the visitor. Enthralled with Walt's newest toy, Moses quickly became adamant that Lincoln would be part of the fair, so much so that, according to biographer Bob Thomas, he once said, I won't open the fair without it, the, exhi the exhibit. Unfortunately, time was running out, and in the months ahead, the project had to be scaled down. Well, we couldn't get the entire Hall of Presidents together in time, said Walt, but we might be able to finish Lincoln from 34 to 1. Having spent the greater part of two years attempting to cart a sponsor, including a plea to Under Secretary of Commerce, Franklin Roosevelt Jr., Moses discovered a most fortuitous circumstance. The state of Illinois legislature had established a commission for the fair, coincidentally proposing an exhibit based on their favorite native son. On a visit to the studio lot, temporary commission chairman Fair Fox Cone found himself overwhelmed after meeting the Lincoln figure. It was a match made in heaven. On November 19th, the centennial obs observance of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, Walt Moses Commission Chairman Ralph Newman and Illinois Governor Otto Kerner gathered in Springfield to announce that Mr. Lincoln would, become, would be coming to the World's Fair. But the announcement was met with criticism, to put it lightly. Much of the public felt that recreating this rever revered individual would be a disgrace. When the show premiered in the summer of 1964, however, the illusion was ultimately found to be more than effective and great moments with Mr. Lincoln would become one of the most popular attractions at the World's Fair. In great moments on audio animatronic, on audio animatronics version of the 16th president stood and addressed the audience with the vocal talent of famed actor Royal Dono, who bore an uncanny resemblance to President Lincoln. The whole effect was so realistic, one newspaper falsely reported that Lincoln stood up and walked forward on the stage, which Imagineer Mayor Davis found to be a heck of a compliment. On July 18, 1965, the show's popularity brought a version of Great Moments to the Disneyland Opera House, where it has since been presented in various forms on and off throughout the years. In the years that followed, WED Imagineers were able to master great realism with advancements in audio animatronics technology, as evidence in the still successful Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean attractions. Sadly, Walt would not live to see even these attractions completed. But with the planning of a whole new Disney World in Central Florida, it seemed about the right time 
to dust off an old project. Thanks for hanging in there, guys. I know that was a bit of a long one, but like I said, that is only part one. I am still working on part two as we speak, so you guys will hopefully be getting that uh, in the days to come. But anyways, if you guys have an opinion on the Hall of Presidents or Grey Most Mr. Lincoln, even right now, before I read part two of the article, please let me know in the comments section down below. I personally liked Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. I've never seen the Hall of Presidents, but Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln did give me a bit of a fright because of a cannon going off in the middle of the show. And truthfully, I've never seen it since because it scared me so much. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. But in the meantime, thank you guys so much for watching. Bye, little skeletons. Stay safe. Love you guys.